Thank you for the introduction, Daron. It uh, feels like a bit of a homecoming here, having a room full of physios. Uh, being surrounded by doctors in my everyday life feels like I can finally speak some sense again. <laughs> so I'd like to talk to you today about how I use low-carbohydrate diets for musculoskeletal conditions. To begin, we're going to take a brief look at something called mechanotherapy. So this has been around in many guises for a number of years. So Henry Davis, he was an American orthopaedic surgeon, first described how soft tissues respond to loading way back in 1867. And several years later, in 1892, Julius Wolff, who was a German surgeon, described something similar for bone. So over time, our understanding of the underlying basis of mechanotherapy has evolved, but essentially, most therapists today will still use that as an underlying aspect of much of the treatment they do. So these images here actually demonstrate how we actually use mechanotherapy to target specific tissues um, for the purposes of healing. On the left here, we can see a picture of the windless mechanism, and on the right, we see an exercise which combines the windless mechanism with loading through the Achilles tendon. There was a very elegant study that was published back in 2015 by Rathleff, which demonstrated that a second daily loading program using this very exercise led to very significant improvements when compared to standard treatments for plantar fasciopathy, which as all, we all know is a very recalcitrant condition in a lot of cases, at the three month mark. So to understand why we get these benefits though, we need to have a look at the structure of connective tissues. So all connective tissues are essentially the same. You have a, a cell which is surrounded by a matrix of collagen fibers, which is called the extracellular matrix. So in this example on the bottom right, we can actually see the cell which is called a chondrocyte or a cell within articular cartilage, which again is surrounded by what is largely a collagen-based matrix. And the cell is actually responsible for supporting and maintaining the function and the health of the surrounding matrix. And it's this matrix which actually gives that connective tissue its mechanical properties be it a tendon, be it ligament, be it bone, be it articular cartilage. This extracellular matrix is critical to the functioning of the tissue. So we've briefly alluded to uh, Krim Khan earlier uh, with, uh, I think it was uh, Paul. And uh, Krim's actually been a strong advocate of educating physiotherapists on mechanotherapy and how it works. When I was an undergraduate physiotherapist back in the 90s, this was unheard of, we knew nothing about it. Now we not only understand that it works, we understand how it works. So on the left hand picture here, we can see a cell. Uh, I'm not sure if that arrow is coming up on the screen there. This is a, uh, a tenocyte or a cell within the tendon. And you can see the yellow fibers there is the collagen fibers that that's supporting. When we actually apply a compressive load to it, in this example, that leads to chemical communications through several uh, pathways, which ends up being translated into gene expression being altered and increased protein synthesis, again, of the extracellular matrix. So we can see this in this graph here, which uh, demonstrates the protein synthesis in response to a bout of exercise. Uh, so if you have a look on the very left-hand column, the basal level or the resting level of protein synthesis, we can see that after exercise, you have an increase in protein synthesis, and that's sustained for about three days. So that suggests to us if we put the correct loading response into a tendon or any other tissues, then we'll have a persistent and sustained response where we can actually get benefit. Now, what we haven't yet taken into account is that same episode of exercise can also lead to degradation of the extracellular matrix. So on this graph here, when we have a look at it, you can see on the top line there, that demonstrates protein synthesis, and the bottom line demonstrates a protein degradation, and the line in the middle represents the net result. So you can see for the first 36 hours or so, you're actually in negative territory, but then after that, and up to about 72 hours, you end up being in positive territory. And this explains to us something that a lot of us already know clinically, that if we're trying to prescribe exercise to facilitate tendon healing, you're often better off prescribing it, especially in the early stages every second or third day, than you are daily. So, uh, and this is certainly something which, uh, since I've modified my practice in response to our new biological understandings, patients have responded much, much better. Now, despite uh, this understanding, we all know that some patients 
just don't respond. Even with the best designed mechanotherapy program, some patients fail. And that leads us to ask the question, is there something that we can do to enhance this balance between catabolic response, breaking the tissue down, and anabolic response, increasing the synthesis of protein? And to answer this question, we need to begin by looking at the main enzyme responsible for collagen degradation, and that's something we call matrix metalloproteinases, which I'm gonna to refer to as MMPs from now on. This picture here, uh, for the scholars out there, you'll recognise that, is Prometheus. So here's a feature in Greek mythology who stole fire from the gods. Now, because of his crime, he was subject to eternal punishment. He was chained to a rock, and he had an eagle come every day and eat his liver. And at night, his liver would regenerate. Now, I don't know how the Greeks knew this, but this is actually remarkably close to the truth. If we cut out a healthy person's three-quarter of their liver, then that liver can completely regenerate. And the reason for this remarkable regenerative capacity of the liver is partially due to what we call basal secretion of these MMPs. So a healthy liver, as part of the normal turnover and regeneration of the liver, will secrete certain amounts of MMPs, and there's 24 types in mammals, but we don't need to know all of them for the moment, and that can facilitate turnover. The problem is that if you start having a sick liver, then it tries to regenerate itself more, and this secretion of MMPs increases. Now, they're not confined to the liver, they're in the circulation. So every tissue in which they become exposed to throughout the circulation is then subject to an increased catabolic force. This is one of the most common conditions which we see and which I see in my practice, which actually leads to this increased catabolic force, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You can see here there's numerous fatty globules spotted throughout the liver, and this is really common in most anybody who's significantly overweight. So now we have the connection between obesity, fatty liver disease, and this increased catabolic load for matrix metalloproteinases, so we can start to understand a lot of the research and our clinical experience which demonstrates why with a very modest degree in weight reduction, we can frequently see very, very large reductions in pain from osteoarthritis. Clearly, it's not just down to an effect of mechanical loading. If it was, then a 10% reduction in weight should equal a 10% reduction in pain, and that's just simply not the case. So this is some serial DEXA scans of one of my patients in the weight loss clinic. And I want you to have a look at the left-hand one to start with. You can see around here, we've got a lot of fat accumulation. And this is the region of the liver. Now, after 9% body weight loss and six months later, we can see that this is essentially resolved. We can also do blood tests after people have lost weight and see whether that demonstrates an improvement in liver function. And what I want you to focus on here is this is another one of my patients who's lost some weight. The very bottom line there, ALT. Now this is a chemical which is normally found in liver cells. And if the liver's in a state of distress, those liver cells can actually release their contents into the circulation. Then we can detect that with a blood test. And if their chemical in particular is elevated above normal levels, that suggests to us the liver is being damaged. And on the bottom line here, we can see that it's gone from 52, which is very high, down to 19, which is very, very healthy. And again, this is not a huge amount of weight loss, but it's enough weight loss to improve liver health. So the upshot of all of this is that in our clinic, we find that about 50% of our patients actually defer or cancel their surgery following weight loss. Now, while it might not absolutely prevent the surgery, for a lot of patients, it buys them a lot of time. And I think it's an absolute credit to the surgeons who actually work here that they actually know that this will reduce their workload, and despite the large mortgages on their waterfront villas, they still refer me patients. <laughs> actually, seriously, I think it actually does speak volumes for the, uh, the attitude and the quality of the surgeons. So, personally, I do have to say thank you. Now, moving on, let's have another look at another mechanism that can impair connective tissue health, particularly relating to diabetics. We all know that people with diabetes have musculoskeletal complaints at significantly higher rates. That can range from something like Dupuytren's contracture through to a frozen shoulder. And that's exactly what we see in the literature. The data would suggest that somebody with diabetes has more than three times the rate 
of tendinopathies than control patients. And the major mechanism for this comes down to the elevation in blood sugar that happens in diabetes. So I want to take you through what happens when you have high blood sugar levels. We all know that if you take a drop of blood in a diabetic, you can actually see the sugar on the metre, and that proves that the sugar levels are increased as they're circulating around. Now, when sugar is sitting in close proximity to a protein, it can actually attach. That process is called non-enzymatic glycosylation. So that's what we're seeing on the left and through to the middle one there. And so in the middle here, we can see the sugars are now bound to the protein. The image on the bottom centre there represents a red blood cell, which has proteins on it, and therefore, because it's sitting in this soup of blood sugar, the sugar can attach to it. And this is what we actually call HbA1c. A lot of you have probably heard of this. And this is a blood test that we do, given the average lifespan of a red blood cell of about 120 days. This gives us an average blood sugar level of about two to three months. So this is good to monitor progress. Now the trouble is once the protein has been glycated, and this could be a collagen protein, remember, it can then be subject to a further process which leads to the development of something called advanced glycosylated end products. And these formation of these products can then lead to cross-linking and several other changes within the proteins. And this cross-linking, especially within connective tissue, within the extracellular matrix, can significantly affect the mechanical properties. So what we can see here is on the left is an example of the cross-linking both within and between the molecules um, contained within tendon. And on the right, we can see how it actually modifies the function of the tissue. It increases the brittleness, reduces the elasticity, and despite that, it leads to an overall reduction in strength of the tissue and reduced remodelling. So the consequence of that clearly is that a diabetic patient is not going to respond as effectively to our exercise loading programs as somebody without these advanced glycosylated end products. Now, understanding how dietary carbohydrate relates to this is critical to understanding why low carbohydrates can be so beneficial. Most people don't realise that complex carbohydrates are actually just chains of glucose molecules. And then when you eat a dietary uh, complex carbohydrate, those glucose molecules simply end up in the bloodstream. Therefore, if the problem is elevated blood sugar levels, cutting out or eliminating carbohydrates from the diet as much as is practicable can lead to significant benefits. And this is what we see. So this blood test which I alluded to earlier, the HbA1c, this is an example of a patient before and after being placed on a low carbohydrate diet. And we can see a reduction in this measure from 74 down to 51. And obviously for this patient, this has potential to lead to improved remodeling of the extracellular matrix and overall improved mechanics of the tissue. Now, uh, just as a final uh, topic for my presentation, I want to introduce you to something called an eicosanoid. Now, this is probably a term which not many of you here are familiar with, but it is critically important. These are chemicals which regulate most of the inflammatory response of the body. We all hear people talk about inflammatory this and inflammatory that, but very few people actually realise what it means. And the meaning is actually related very much to these chemicals. These are actually derived from two fats, omega-3 fats and omega-6 fats, which we're probably all very familiar with. Now, this is a pathway which demonstrates how these omega-6 and omega-3 fats form eicosanoids. So the eicosanoids are the chemicals um, down the very bottom. Now, we're going to go through it step by step. So looking at omega-6 on the left, this is the fat that's found in vegetable and seed oils. And you can see that it progresses down to the point where it forms something called arachidonic acid. This is very pro-inflammatory. If you then act on it with certain enzymes on the arachidonic acid, you can form very inflammatory products, which we often treat with medications. As an example, the series two prostaglandins down the bottom middle, that's what we use anti-inflammatory medication for. So if we can reduce the amount of uh, substrate going down the left-hand pathway there, we reduce the need for anti-inflammatories. You'll notice the omega-3 pathway on the right doesn't have these inflammatory products, and these are competitive pathways. 
you'll note that they use the same two enzymes down the middle here, the delta-5 and delta-6 desaturases. So if we want to improve our omega-6 to 3 balance, we reduce the dietary intake of one and increase the dietary intake of the other. And uh, the way we do that, we have an understanding of the ratio of these fats in different uh, dietary intakes. And in this graph here, blue is represented by omega-6 and orange represents omega-3. So this actually gives us a really good uh, head start. If we want to uh, nuance the intake, then we use our knowledge of this to make specific recommendations. And this individual here was able to, over a period of 12 months by modifying the intake of these fats, reduce their omega-6 to 3 ratio from 3.2 on the left down to 1.6, they halved it. That's a magnificent result purely achieved through modification of dietary fats. Now, the benefits of this are clear. On the top C-reactive protein, this is a marker of blood inflammation which we use regularly in our clinic. And we can see this patient had a large drop in their inflammatory load. This means that they don't need as many anti-inflammatory medications, they recover quicker from exercise, and also as an aside, they have a massive cardiovascular benefit. There's been two very large prospective studies, one published in New England Journal, one published in JAMA, two very good quality journals, that found the difference between the group that had the highest level of omega-3 in their cells and the lowest level, the difference in all-cause mortality was 10 times. That says the group with the bad levels had 10 times the increased risk of heart attack. So significant benefits. So in conclusion, I'd just like you to think about when you see your patients in the clinic, try and be cognizant of could this patient benefit from metabolic management? Could this patient also benefit from dietary management? Is there something that we could do that would facilitate and optimise the exercise therapy which I'm providing? And uh, I hope the answer is less. Um, so that's my talk, so thank you very much. <laughs>